Jesus. Ito. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'll just start to let people in. Are there people in there? Not yet. Okay. Okay, there are three so far. Four. And it's a webinar setting, we can't see in, right? We can't see Yeah. In. Yeah. Okay. We just want to know the five, six attendees. Hi, everyone. See your names popping up. I don't know if your sound is uh, appearing uh, yet, but I'm seeing the names coming up. I see Brian, Ashwini, um, Ishan, Kui, Kuisin, right? Or, or, yeah, somebody yeah. asked for passport. Many of you. Great, great. Um, I see Gibson. Gibson, hello. Yeah, we've uh, known you for some time. Uh, yeah, great. I see a lot of names that are very familiar. Martin Talk, right? Sarah, Michael, Costas, Joanne. Uh, yes, hi everyone who's uh, here. There's 21 of you already. It's great. Um, okay, uh, we're going to maybe just let people stream in a little bit more. Maybe just about one or two minutes. Um, and then we will kick off. Right, in the meanwhile, just uh, hang in there. Okay, we see you, Zoe. more coming in. Okay, those of you who are here, just some housekeeping. Uh, you know, uh, this is a webinar format, so you will not be able to, uh, I mean, your video will not be on, right? Uh, we wish we could do that, but um, we we just have a cleaner recording when it's uh, uh, using the webinar format, right? And uh, there's many of you, so uh, there's actually many of you, yeah. So, um, so it's actually a lot uh, less distracting if we do it this way uh, and then we will look at the um, the q a panel we will constantly monitor that to see um, who's uh, asking us questions right so if you have anything just just uh, submit in the q a uh, raise your hand or send a chat a comment okay uh, we will have uh, some uh, alumni and also current students who are helping to to watch those things um, today uh, we will try to uh, not uh, I mean, at least some of us will stay till uh, all the questions are answered. Um, those of you who have questions uh, that you have never had a chance to ask, um, yeah, you will get it answered today. Okay, uh, great. I think we, we, we will start now so that we don't uh, leave uh, those who are on time waiting. Um, okay, we have uh, quite many people. Uh, okay, uh, we have uh, with us today many uh, of the teachers at DID, five of us actually. Um, and then we also have a, a bunch of uh, students, okay, uh, students and also alumni. Um, if you see on your screen on top, you see Karina, Yijing, right? Uh, Li Ying, Tommy, Cheryl, I think that's about it for students and alumni. And then, of course, we have uh, with us Dr. Yen, Dr. Yen, who is a <laughs> Dr. Yen, who is a um, how should I say this nicely? <laughs> in ancient? No, I mean I, I say this in a nice way. I mean I, I mean in a in a in a, in a, in a way that uh, not 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 nice way, but like uh, in a, a fond way. Because Doctor Yen was my, my teacher last time, right? Uh, so you have a very strange dynamic going on here where uh, you have a few generations of teachers, right? Um, yeah. So Doctor Yen is the master shifu. So you know, yeah, he's the man. And Brian just just commented there, right? Um, yeah, so a lot of uh, special people to me here also. Um, like even Brian, you know, uh, he was, uh, I would say in my earlier years of teaching, he was in NUS for a little while, right? Uh, and we, we taught together and now he's back again, right? Uh, of course, we have Clement and JJ who are going to share with you some very exciting things, right? Uh, so I, I can't kind of wait uh, to, to hear all the five minutes things that everyone has prepared to share with you. Um, of course, I hope this doesn't count to my five minutes thing. You know, I'm, I'm, my time is up. Yeah. But anyway, um, uh, the, the students and uh, alumni who are with us, uh, 
feel free to just chime in anytime, okay? Or the rest of the teachers, feel free to chime in anytime. Uh, it'd be great to just uh, keep this casual. I think um, we, you know, in Instagram, it's a little bit hard to, it's a bit, you know, quick and, uh, yeah. But this one, I think we can kind of spend a bit more time talking, okay? Uh, now, so I'm going to just uh, move on first. Uh, there is a little poll that uh, AJ, AJ, who's also on the call and helping us to administer this, uh, would like us to do. Uh, I'll let her pull it up, right? The poll will help us understand better who we're talking to, right? So if there's, uh, yeah, if there's, you know, um, uh, ways we can tailor the message for you, I think we would try to, okay? Yep, please do the poll. Oh, I have to do it also. <laughs> I'm others, I guess. Oh, you don't have to. <laughs> it's, it's on my screen. Okay, while we do the poll, I would just say that uh, somewhat on behalf of all the other teachers also, that the five minute timeline is really short, uh, but we'll try to do what we can. Uh, you know, because if five of us are speaking five minutes each, that's already like almost half an hour, right? We'll try to do as, uh, as what we can, uh, as fast as we can, but also at the same time, deliver to you the content that, uh, that uh, you're expecting, okay? Oh, is it done, AJ? Okay, I'll end it now. See the last few of you who haven't polled yet. Okay, ending. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, do you see the results? No, we don't. I don't oh. see it at least. Oh, oh I think I must do the poll and I can see it actually. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. it's coming up, it's coming up. Great. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Oh, right. oh. Okay, very cool. Um, many of you from uh, design-related and non-design-related study um, more of you from non-design related study. Uh, that's uh, uh, maybe I'll just say that you know uh, I was not from design related study. I don't think Clement was also. <laughs> uh, yeah, so many of us are not. Right, in case that's the kind of concerns that you ever have, uh, a lot of us don't have that background. But we we're, we're happily uh, were in DID, and then now some of us are teaching here. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, dive into mine and then give myself a. Five minutes, I hope. Um, okay, let's try it. Okay, so today we're gonna uh, share with you a little bit um, on some thoughts, you know, around uh, your your uni choices. Uh, and of course, here is to give you more like a mini webinar. And then, uh, yeah, I, I just think that um, you know our uni choices really can make a big difference. And I say this because um, myself uh, was a DID student. I kind of like stumbled into it uh, accidentally. Right, uh, and uh, it's it's been uh, probably the best thing that has happened for me. Right, so um, the I, I so I can I can uh, feel and attest to this being a really big decision for you. And so I just want to um, congratulate uh, all of you here who who make this effort to just spend you know an hour or two to just process this uh, for yourself. Right, um, yeah. Hopefully, you find something useful to take back. Okay, so uh, it can really make a big difference because for me particularly, you know, uh, even my life, uh, <laughs> even my, uh, you know, this is this uh, not exactly friends, they are friends, they are classmates, they are, um, but uh, I got married in DID. <laughs> or rather, you know, the, the, just, uh, just a fun little fact, uh, you yeah, know, me and my wife, we met in DID um, and we, we took our wedding photo in DID. Now we have four kids. This is a picture of three, uh, there's four. Right, so these, uh, DID really made a big difference for me. And just to be very fast, um, I will share with you a bit of the works that I did in the past and uh, also what happened for me as a student you know, in DID. So I finished my uh, final year uh, doing uh, this project, Leap Frog, uh, under Dr. Yen. Right? So Dr. Yen was my thesis tutor. Um, and one of the nicest things for me about uh, this project is, you know, even though I didn't have the um, knowledge and skill to subsequently take it on to commercialize myself, but um, as a project, uh, it got some traction, and then you know the function made sense. Uh, a company called uh, Zentic uh, took it over and licensed it, and now it's a real product, right? So um, that's something that I'm really happy about. Uh, the yeah, so it's now being used by cerebral palsy kids. Uh, not not exactly the same thing, but uh, the functionality is almost there, right? So that's uh, something that I'm really glad about in my journey in DID, and then. Uh, after, after my final year, uh, I went to work in this place. Uh, um, so, you know, in case um, you just want to get a sense of what happens to uh, 
DID graduates. Uh, for me, I took the route of uh, consultancy, and this is where I first worked. Uh, it was in uh, Eindhoven, right? Uh, and they do kind of uh, interesting uh, electronics uh, products. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what things are like. Um, I had a chance subsequently to uh, work in San Francisco, where I um, where I uh, worked on this project uh, called the Arc Mouse. Um, it's till now I think my favorite project because um, for me at least it it marries the uh, twin interests that I have around uh, design and also uh, mechanisms, right? Um, and because for me at the time I was a trainee. Right, uh, in that company and uh, having the chance to um, have the work that I do end up being uh, the thing that is produced for more than 10 years now, I think um, is really encouraging for me. It allows me to kind of like uh, feel like I can do the next thing again, the next thing again, right? And so subsequently, um, uh, as a short summary, I started uh, a studio uh, called Stark Design and these are the kind of uh, works that we get to do, right? Um, so industrial design sometimes bring, brings you to different uh, routes. And um, in this case, uh, you know, we've started a studio, we've, we do a mix of uh, hard goods, soft goods, uh, software, um, and that still kind of goes on. Uh, in, in these days, I like to play a little bit with uh, more interactive stuff. So you might have seen kind of funny things like that on, online, where we were proposing things like lift buttons that uh, move in sync with your finger, right? Just like Darth Vader. Um, but that's all playing with uh, new possibilities. and. Uh, I think design uh, grows along with you as you change your um, interests, uh, as you change also perhaps, you know, uh, the context, meaning uh, the tech that's available, the, the things that are in trend, you know, things change along so you can see that transition, okay? Um, well, I'm really talking really fast, right? Just to meet the time. Okay, let's see. Now, um, now our team now uh, is about 30 people and many of us are really happy. <laughs> Yeah, we, most of us are from uh, NUS industrial design, but um, just as to share the mixture of work that we do uh, spans uh, far beyond uh, just uh, physical products. You know, a lot of us do research, uh, interfaces, um, and of course, tinkery things too, right? Uh, uh, many of uh, the team here are world classmates, were students um, of ours, and um, but it's really like just one big family at this point. Okay. Now, uh, let me see, <laughs> you can see I'm very lazy. I just put everything on the tab, right? Um, so the next, next tab I have, uh, just to tell you a bit more of the kind of works that I teach in NUS, um, I tend nowadays to like to teach things which are a little bit more playful, a bit more crazy. So um, just one to highlight is uh, this uh, bubble sanitizer thing, uh, which actually I think we have eating on the call, eating did this with a few of his teammates. Um, I just like the idea of uh, rules being broken and objects being challenged a bit more than, uh, than just uh, designing to be nicer to use, you know, like um, why, why should a sanitizer um, for COVID um, be <laughs> like, a, like something that you press and drips down? Uh, why, why not give it more delight? Uh, in this case, this is a prototype, so it doesn't look like the render over there. Uh, but certainly, the concept is, for me, very interesting. Uh, because, you know, if we talk about uh, encouraging, say, children to use the sanitizers more, that, that uh, has some links. Okay, so that's uh, an area that I like to teach now. Uh, and the other area that if you, if you are here with us in DID uh, at some point, uh, that I also like to do quite a bit is uh, the uh, entrepreneurial projects, right? So uh, I would say most, uh, maybe all of the Kickstarter projects are done uh, in my classes um, where we uh, get students to really go into the deep end uh, to release things. Uh, AJ, who's on this call, actually worked on this Levitate, right? Uh, that was one of her products, right? Um, they sold a bunch, right? Yeah, some of them made more, some of them didn't make so much, but uh, it's just an interesting experience overall, okay? Yep, so I'm gonna... Um, uh, pause here on this part and just jump back to my slides because we promise you that uh, we will do a bit of a uh, you know, mini, mini lesson, right? Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do a mini lesson in like one minute or two minutes for you, okay? So that everyone has some take home for, um, for, for design standpoint. No, this is not the lesson, but uh, yeah. So this is the question for you, okay? All of you, and, I, and if you can just type in the comment, um, you know, uh, you, you are familiar with this, this uh, kind of objects, right? Um, these are training bicycles. Uh, the one on the right side, I'll just explain it a little bit more to you. It's very interesting. It's a rather high-tech uh, uh, concept, right? Where 
the faster you ride, the two wheels converge at the bottom. So it feels like a two wheel bicycle, which means that you don't actually have to have someone hold you because the momentum will keep you balanced. Um, so quite interesting and quite sophisticated. And now the one on the left is the usual training wheels. Now, uh, maybe in your comments, can you guys let me know what do you think is the better training bike, one or two? Can you type in the comments? Okay. Okay, not. You can type in the chat. Yeah, yeah. The, the chat. Yeah, the chat. Mm. Not the Q&A, uh, the, the chat. Ooh, okay, I see Costa says two. How about the rest? All right. The right one. A lot of people say the right one is the more interesting one or the better design. Okay, so... Uh, that's great. I uh, hope there was a little quick mental exercise. Now let's go to the next question. Yeah, it will, it will continue from here. Okay, uh, I'll not review the answer yet. Now I'm going to add a third one into the mix. The third one is a balanced bike, they call it. Basically, it's a bike that nobody, uh, or rather there's no pedals. Um, so what is your answer now? Between one, two, and three. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to answer it, or maybe just one minute to answer it. One, two, or three. Is a better training bike. Two, still two. A lot of people say two, right? Two is very sophisticated. Gibson chose one. Michael chose two. Many, many people chose two. Okay. Uh, cost three looks like it's a almost no effort kind of product, right? Just take away the pedal. Um, okay. Now I'm going to show you a little quick video. Uh, have a look at this. Um, I'm going to play this, yeah? Watch. There's no sound, so don't worry about it. This is a two-year-old boy, never really learned cycling, right? Doesn't really need to have training wheels, um, can run on this and then start to balance uh, because, uh, you know, it basically functions a little bit like your legs are like the training wheels, right? So there's something very interesting here um, where, you know, uh, one sometimes might say that like a solution um, in design uh, can be more sophisticated, add more features. Um, but sometimes you see that this, this, in this case, right, this is a great example of a product that um, allows a kid to learn very naturally and very quickly. Um, and the product is the, probably the cheapest one to make of all, right? Um, the boy in this picture here is my son and uh, all of my kids are, use the balance bike and in two or three months, they are on a pedal bike by themselves, right? So we, we, we don't have to teach them cycling at all. My daughter was, uh, was uh, in decathlon one of the days uh, after playing balance bikes for like, a couple of months. And she said, I just want to pedal the, the pedal bike. And these are bikes without training wheels in decathlon. In 15 minutes, she was cycling around the whole place by herself. Nobody taught her anything. So um, which is the better, <laughs> better product right now, right? Um, uh, what we're thinking about, because in design, very oftentimes is about judgment and knowing how to judge, especially knowing that you use the least resources to create the biggest impact is, probably one of the best things uh, to, 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 um, to create you know, in this world. We don't need to keep adding things to be complex. Now, the bike in, this, in, in the picture over here, the second one, um, to be very frank with you, I was also really uh, interested in this bike when I was a student, right? Um, this was this is, is rather old concept. I thought it was really genius and phenomenal. I think it won quite a lot of design awards, right? But on hindsight now, as a more, uh, you know, after years of practicing, I think that the womb bike is a much better uh, proposition. So uh, what can you take away from here? Okay. Um, the, the, the main creative difference is that, you no, know, uh, in this case, instead of adding more, we reduce and uh, things became much better. Now, uh, if you want a little method, and I think I'm running out of time, I'm going to just show, show you a little snapshot of a method, right? Um, I'm going to start from uh, just, just a second. Okay. Um, sometimes creative processes, they, they occur like that. You know, uh, someone just has a whim to say, ah, let's just make a no pedal bike. It's probably easy to make and might still be fun for the kids, right? With no intention at all to make this a training bike, right? It's just because it's a low cost bike to build, right? And then he builds it with a half hopeful state that because it's, it's a bit of a poor proposition, right? Um, so it's a bit of like a random, crazy, idealistic or intending to fail kind of idea. When you experience your half uh, baked idea, you realize that actually maybe it works quite well as a learning bike instead of like a uh, actual bike to play. And then you start to say that, hey, maybe it should be something else then, you know, and you say, let's adjust it to then be a good learning bike. And that might be how a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interesting new products occur because 
um, you weren't expecting it, you weren't trying to create it, and therefore there's a level of uh, surprise to it when it comes out. And sometimes this kind of uh, trajectory causes you to preserve some kind of creative spark. Now, uh, something that you might be very familiar with is was also done in the same way, right? The, the adhesive on uh, uh, post-it notes, right, was intended to be a very strong, super strong aircraft construction adhesive, which failed horribly, right? So um, they found it horrible, not, not performing anything, but then in that useless state, realized that it's quite interesting that it allows you to reposition paper and that became the post-it, okay? So now if you're going to take something back from, from here, uh, what you can consider is this. In your process, if you're trying to create new things, perhaps um, try something random, uh, doomed to fail, crazy or ideal, and then don't bet on it. Just do what, what comes from it. And then after that, see what does it want to do or for who can this work well? Then maybe you can adjust it to be another good product, okay? Um, I'm going to finish now. Uh, actually, what I'm trying to say is in innovation and design, sometimes just trying really matters, okay? Um, and at Stark, we have a bit of this mantra called don't try, don't know, right? Uh, one of our founders uh, yeah, always says that and it has almost become our mantra that everybody repeats at Stark. All right, um, thanks very much. I'm going to hand over the time to the next teacher. Sorry, I exceeded a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, even though I talk like super fast. Uh, now we'll do all the Q&As at the end uh, so, so that we don't interrupt all the sharing, okay? Uh, and then you can, of course, uh, think through what you want to ask uh, for the different tutors. I think next up is JJ, right? JJ, uh, JJ runs Service Design Lab in NUS. Uh, she has a lot of interesting work in the service design space. Uh, many of the students nowadays, they like to do uh, projects that can influence institutions, you know, uh, uh, government organizations uh, and with, with, uh, with a thorough study, you know, of how things flow, how things work. Uh, for information and for, for services, okay? Uh, so I'll leave her to kind of uh, uh, explain further. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Um, hi, everyone. I'm JJ from NUS. Uh, thanks for joining us today on Saturday. Uh, I'm sure that you have better things to do on Saturday afternoon. So we will try to make this session fruitful and entertaining uh, as much as possible. So here today, um, I'm going to talk about whether a new player in the field of design called the service design. Let me start with this. Share screen. So do you see the, 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 the screen, the full screen? Is it? Okay, good. Okay, so think of your day, you know, so when you go to work or when you go to school, uh, you might uh, check your bus schedule with um, the bus or the transportation app and you get uh, your food ordered through, you know, the Grab or Deliveroo or Pen Food Panda. And you take care of your health by uh, participating in uh, this Lumi Health Challenge. And nowadays you even receive Ang Pao, um, with this um, TBS, uh, the QR code. And then in the afternoon or, or in your bed before going to sleep, you browse what to buy and what to sell through this carousel. So come to think of it, everything that we interact every day is actually service. So services are kind of really shaping our, uh, our, our, our days. Then um, surprisingly, uh, people don't really think that there are people behind who design all these services. You know, these services to, should be designed and created. Then uh, the important question is, um, the services should provide a meaningful and a pleasurable experiences for people who use and who interact the services. So how could we then design for services that are meaningful and pleasurable to people? So this is the, the core question for service design. And service design is the new design uh, area that deals with that question. Uh, so in service design, those services are new design objects that go beyond the tangible product like this or like the chair. The services, those intangible, volatile, dynamic services are the new objects of design. And here in NUS, and with our, the, the Singapore has a very strong service economy, 
and we have a uh, very strong players in the service sector. So here in NUS for past a few years, we have uh, actively collaborated with uh, various organizations and companies from public sector and the private sector and even NGO, not just, you know, with me and also with uh, uh, my, uh, my colleagues in NUS. So you see uh, like the, the, some of the big banks in uh, Singapore and the government organizations who wanted to adopt service design and who we uh, did the services and projects together. So let me maybe uh, just give you a gist of uh, what our students do in the service design project. Uh, we, within the service design project, our students uh, go through very iterative and uh, divergent and the convergent process that is often characterized as double diamond uh, model you know, that consists of discover, define, develop, and deliver. So our students always start with um, really meeting, observing, and the talking to users and the stakeholders in the, the area of service or the, in the area of the problems that they are interested. So we students go out there and they talk to you know, users, and then they translate their findings into new ideas. And then they develop their ideas through role play, prototyping and various ideas techniques and visualization techniques. And then at the end, they deliver uh, their service ideas in various forms. So I might just introduce a few uh, recent examples uh, that have been taught in services and studio here in NUS. In 2019, with also the emerging uh, data economy, we did a project uh, exploring how uh, we could create a new service design, op uh, new service opportunities based on or enabled by open data, by the data. So this project was done in collaboration with uh, GovTech, especially the open government products team. The students came up with uh, various service ideas, service concepts using the open data and personal data. So for example, one of the, uh, this is the one of the uh, outcome by our students. So they, uh, they um, used the Singapore Heritage uh, open data and create a new service for young people in Singapore to explore and learn about Singapore heritage and Singapore history by also combining uh, the survey concept with the AR technology, as you see here. So they can kind of do the, the, the travel back to the past. With this net, you can now listen to an audio track to immerse yourself into the historical events that happened in the past. You can also use the slider to view how much the site has changed over the years. Start appreciating. And another uh, project is Service Design is also uh, uh, used as a, uh, the tool for helping digital transformation of various businesses. So in 2018, uh, we did a, a Service Design project for enabling human centered digital transformation for quite unusual industry, which is harbor and the marine uh, industry. They are really looking for this digital transformation and we use the service design as a methodology there. So in collaboration with the PSA, Jurong Port and Resource Marine, the students yeah, really um, study the needs of employees and the management. And they combine the like, cutting edge technology like drone, sensor technologies, and AI. So they um, develop the concept for how the port industry can champion the digital uh, transformation. Helps with large scale storage planning. Clicking on a zone provides a zoomed in view. By hovering over the map, you can get so in capacity. those projects, uh, three uh, uh, mantra <laughs> or three uh, core things that I want to emphasize is uh, or uh, the the skill sets or the the uh, the core um, uh, capabilities required for service designers or students who do service design are firstly empathy, the empathic mindset to users and also the stakeholders who are involved in the service area. The second thing is collaborative mindset because service design is about aligning the needs of different stakeholders. So, so creating the collaborative relationship is another important thing in service design. But lastly, service design deals with the multiple touch points that are aligned in the journey experience that go beyond a single uh, product. So thinking in system is important. So these three things are what I aim to uh, equip our students also. 
Um, so for supporting that, one of the core methods or the tools that open use in service design is co-design or co-design workshops. Meaning basically it's a, we basically invite our users and the stakeholders and experts in the process of design. So in a way democratizing the design process so that we can learn from our users and we can also learn uh, what are the features that they are envisioning? So through the visual and the tangible tools, we ID together and we prototype together. For example, that uh, Jurong Port project that I showed before, they conducted a cohesion workshops with uh, the, the officer, uh, the employees who work in the port, and they created ideas together on how the digital uh, system should be designed in the future. Um, so if you know more, uh, if you want to know more about the service design and, and those projects, uh, you can you know, simply Google service design lab Singapore or visit uh, service design lab.net and you can find uh, the more projects and the tools that we are using uh, in our service design project. Looking forward to seeing you. So I will stop here. Thank you. So should I introduce the next speaker or Don, please? <laughs> I think AJ wants to do a little poll before we do the next speaker, right? Okay, hold on. Let me exit you. Stop. AJ, do you want to introduce Clement after that? Uh, <laughs> I think he can, he can do a better <laughs> job by introducing himself though. <laughs> okay, 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 let me... Um, release a poll. Just to, I think just to get a sense of like why you guys are here, like what do you want to take away from mm. this session? Yeah, just, just quickly, uh, you see the poll, right? Yep. This is the last poll, don't worry about it. Okay. No, uh, there won't, won't be another one. Okay, 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, a bit more. 70%. Okay, I'm ending in 3 seconds. 3, 2, 1, okay. Can you see? Share results. Do you see the results? Yeah, we can see it. Hmm. Yeah. Great. Actually, quite many of you are coming this year, actually, right? Cool. Yeah. About half applying to the ID this year and want to find out more or considering whether or not, but still want to find out more. And actually, majority also mostly to learn more about design and creativity. Hmm. Oh, cool. That's okay. cool. That's cool. Clement, over to you then, right? Oh. Yeah, I'm sure you introduce yourself much better than we can. <laughs> um, not sure about that, but... <laughs> anyway, uh, Clement is a tech wizard, right? Uh, it's a bit like a, if we talk about design plus technology kind of a magician, uh, he's, he's what uh, embodies that, right? See, I think Don already did a better job um, introducing me than I ever could. But um, anyway, uh, happy Saturday, everyone. Um, my name is Clement, and I'm uh, really happy to be able to share with you guys today. Uh, like Don, I'm also a DID alumni. Uh, in fact, uh, I was, um, I mean, I was a doctor student. I was also Don's student when he was a very young uh, teacher. Uh, yeah, he's still very young. But um, anyway, uh, I... I, um, after my DID experience, I actually got to go over to US to do grad school and now I'm back for uh, slightly less than a year and I've been researching and teaching uh, at the division. And so I uh, just wanted to start with this statement, uh, which is kind of core to the work that I do. Um, and I think we can all agree that computing is everywhere right now, right? And everything that we see uh, around us, there's probably a computer embedded in the thing that is kind of collecting data or that is kind of communicating to the cloud and, and you know, transferring information uh, at, uh, at such high frequencies. And, and this statement is, is really what is uh, carrying through all, all the work that I do and all the teaching that I do uh, at DID. And it really started actually when I was in year four when uh, a couple of uh, professors actually introduced me to 3D printing. And so if you think about 3D printing, uh, is this idea that, um, you know, you design uh, in a computer, a computer-aided design file, a 3D model, and somehow you're able to convert this 3D model into uh, a series of instructions that a printer uh, that spits out plastic filament is able to 
uh, recreate that, that digital model is now able to recreate it into a physical model, right? So uh, I think co computing is everywhere, this statement. It doesn't just affect um, our lives, but uh, it also very, really profoundly affects that the way that we design. And so that's something that is really on my mind um, in, in, in my work, in, the, in what I research and in what I teach. And so uh, in terms of my specializations, uh, I mainly look at two areas, uh, computational design and interaction design. And so for my sharing today, I kind of slapped together a bunch of work, um, you know, my, my own research work, as well as the classes I run with students that kind of give you a glimpse into the kind of computational design and interaction design stuff that you might do actually in uh, at DID. And so to begin, uh, so this is a very old work, quite early in my career, where I was looking at, you know, can we actually define uh, shapes? Can we define physical products? Uh, not by sketching on a paper or like 3D modeling it, but actually can we define a product through a computer program, right? And so this is a risk accessory whereby uh, it's, uh, there are infinitely many variations of this risk accessory and, and it's controlled by an algorithm. And because with 3D printing, we can manufacture things one at a time. We don't have to actually manufacture uh, mass produce things, right? We can actually uh, have this mass customization model for uh, a fashion accessory. And along the same lines, uh, looking at 3D printing as a new manufacturing technique, well, not so new now, but back when I was doing this, it was, it was still fairly cutting edge. I think now it's almost everywhere. Um, I was really looking at how to push the boundaries of uh, 3D printing by creating geometries that cannot be produced by traditional means, right? How do you create these super thin interlocking structures that transform plastic, in this case, it's nylon, like polyamide, transform it to be uh, very rigid at some points, but almost like a fabric and textile at other points. And with 3D printing, we can do so. And as, as I moved on, uh, I got more and more interested into material science as well as interaction design and, and trying to combine the two together. So over here is, is a work that I was doing in my PhD, looking at how um, you know, we could turn something as democratic as paper uh, into a functioning uh, electronic sensor. So you can see on the left, uh, this, is a, this is a kind of paper that you actually use in the physics classroom to uh, teachers use it to teach like Ohm's law and to model uh, electrical phenomena. But um, through, through my research, I actually discovered that it can sense physical deformation and you can etch uh, kind of functional electronic circuits on top of it. And accompanying that with traditional paper craft techniques like kirigami and origami, you're able to create these buttons you know, that, that are able to respond to a touch and, and be able to use to control a digital interface. And, and so one more project of my own. Um, I, I'm also a really avid video gamer. I love video games. I love the design of video games. Uh, I love designing video games. And so uh, on the side, you know, when, when I have the time, uh, a couple of friends and I, we like to get together and kind of just come up with this really crazy um, new video game ideas. This is an alternative game controller whereby, uh, imagine if you took a traditional game controller, but you pop off all the inputs and now all these floating inputs are, are a resource that you have to negotiate with your collaborator, right? Your, your player, like you have to literally snatch uh, an input away from your, from your uh, friend if you, if you want to use it. Uh, what, what if game controllers were like that? And so we, we built it and we actually brought it down to uh, the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco and, and uh, had 500 people play it and, uh, and break it. But um, yeah, it was a really cool experience. So this is just a glimpse into my own work. And you know, for me, uh, as a designer, as well as, uh, as a design educator, what is quite central is this idea that electronics and code is a material um, alongside physical materials. And, and so how can we treat them like we treat physical materials? How can we design with them as if we are exploring them like physical materials? And so this is quite central to the way that I teach uh, at DID. And uh, just to show you, uh, this was uh, a platform that I, a design studio that I ran last semester where I was introducing students uh, to computer vision. So computer vision, is this big thing, but specifically I was looking at these like QR, QR code look, look, looking things. Uh, these are augmented reality markers and a computer vision system is able to recognize them. And they're able to tell you the position, the identity of the markers. And, and so I got students to explore, you know, what kind of physical interactions can you detect uh, with only uh, a camera and these uh, 
fiducial markers and they have to like figure out physical means of uh, manipulating them. And so you can see this is a snapshot of some of the physical interactions, uh, for instance, even using a hairdryer to kind of uh, blow, you know, these strips of paper until the marker is revealed. And, you know, with these insights, uh, students built a couple of projects. Uh, so this, uh, and, and we, were, we were looking at COVID as kind of the context, like how can we create DIY kits to augment the way that we learn, play and work at home, right? And, and so this is one project uh, uh, by Karina, UNT and Pras. Karina is actually uh, one of the students here today. And they were looking at creating these uh, DIY controllers such that you can create any kind of control that you want to play, for example, a game. So this is uh, a rhythm game. Uh, instead of playing on a keyboard and mouse like you would traditionally do, what if you can create like a unique controller uh, to augment that experience? And just to show another project, uh, this is by Shuyin, Kian, and Zisin. Um, they were creating this uh, cardboard robot uh, and, and by slotting your phone into this robot, it's actually able to uh, playback rhythms. And so it's, it's to kind of teach rhythm and music in, in a playful uh, kind of creative way for, for children. And so this is, uh, this is a class that year two, uh, threes and fours take. And then um, I also teach a year one design fundamentals class where uh, I expose these uh, first year students to electronics, but kind of like I was saying, like to expose them to electronics as a material. And so they make their own sensors. They don't actually buy anything off the shelves. They have to construct these electronic sensors from scratch. And you can see these some of the students' sketches about how they're imagining different interactions uh, uh, with simple materials like paper and copper tape. And for their final project, they have to build, uh, you can see that game controllers are kind of a thing for me. Um, they have to build these controllers for the classic game Snake. So every student has to control the same game, but the experience is different depending on the controller that they built, right? So this is a hit banging controller by Kalinda. Uh, you, you literally hit bang in order to uh, control the snake. Um, this is a uh, juicy controller uh, using the capacitive nature of citrus fruits to uh, control the snake by stabbing those, uh, uh, you know, oranges and lemons. Um, it was very fragrant uh, playing this game. And um, this is another controller. It's a marble controller where you actually have to like target and drop the marble accurately in order to uh, control the snake and, and how it moves. And so th th these were um, interfaces that our uh, year one fundamental students built at the end of six weeks. So within six weeks from knowing nothing about any of these electronics, they built a functioning game controller. So uh, just to quickly end, um, uh, I don't really have a mantra or, or uh, something that I really want to teach, but um, I have a provocation for all of you. And so something that's, uh, that's been on my mind recently is, uh, you know, how can we take charge or design in a world where, you know, everything actually comes ready-made? And so if you're thinking about a career in design or even just as a human being, um, maybe one thing I'd like you all to consider is how we can take more ownership of the things around us. And uh, one thing that, all of you can really try, and I promise you it's actually quite fun, uh, even though it might seem daunting, is to take something apart today, right? Uh, take something apart. This was a broken alarm clock radio that um, I was working on recently. Uh, take something apart. And, and, you know, a few questions that you can ask yourself, like, how does it come apart? Is it designed to actually come apart? Or is it designed to break uh, the moment you try to disassemble it? You know, how does it work? Uh, how does it assemble uh, back together? Where are the parts from? And, and how can you modify it? Or how can you hack it? Or how can you re repair it? Uh, and I think that these, um, these tryouts uh, would be quite beneficial, especially for anyone who wants to kind of get into this uh, digital computational design or, or interaction design space in the future. Yeah, so that's all from me. Uh, and should I hand it off to the next person? Uh, actually, who is who is the next? I think Dr. Yen is the next person. So, um, I I mean I think Dr. Yen can introduce himself way better than me. But um, here is here is our beloved mentor, my teacher when I was a student, uh, Dr. Yen, and I'm sure he has a lot of uh, wisdom to share as well. Okay, thanks, Clement. Yeah. Okay, next to me, you guys. Oh, uh, I'm Yen Jin Chen. Okay. At this moment, I'm the, also have uh, the other two posts in NUS. I'm the co-director in KL NUS Skill Center, uh, so as I'm a deputy director for NUS Center for Ticket Manufacturing. So basically, the uh, 
you can see from the photo there, right? For myself, I do a lot of different type of medical equipment design or design for healthcare. So just now, I don't mention about uh, his thesis project for the uh, CP children or the one you can see here. We did work with hospital very often. And for myself, I believe is in the university, what we need to do is we need to try to provide appropriate context for the student. And since I was a uh, the one to initiate or the one to plan the whole DID curriculum in the first place. Now, uh, the most of the curriculum still run under uh, the, the same idea. So roughly I can try to let you know what are you going to expect to get and how can you plan? Because basically, right, for the DID education is very different from other people. I think if you study from uh, in Singapore, uh, quite often everything that people plan for you. And then they try to ask you, say, okay, in year one, you need to learn this, year two, you need to learn this. And then if you go overseas in the uh, design education, it's the same story. So uh, quite often in year one, you may, they may tell you, say, you need to learn some sketching, year two, you need to learn some, uh, maybe start to do a smaller type of project about electronic product. And then year three, to have a slightly bigger scale, and then to do something for special, and then year four, have a some sort of final year project. So in the end, the main problem is uh, you will see a lot of, uh, project very uniform. And then a lot of things is like, a, you cannot see the distinguished point or the unique point of the thinking for the designer. And that's a different part for our division. We did try to think about how can we educate different type of thinker? How can we educate different type of people to uh, different industry? Because you see Singapore is quite small. So uh, the one here you can see is something called a design platform system, which we introduced about 10 years ago. And so far, I know quite a few universities overseas try to copy the system from us and then try to see how can they do a multidisciplinary type of collaboration. And in some certain sense, we do much more earlier than other uh, universities. So in the education, right, that's just what I mentioned, say it's quite layering. And so for most of the students, right, they don't have a chance to watch each other. But the main problem is when you go to industry, it's very different. That don't when he go to his design consultancy, when he set up design consultancy, he won't talk to his junior designer and say, oh, you are a junior designer. So now you only can do a mouse design. No, mouse is so important. And then it could be a senior designer, they can do it. But quite often it's a whole team. There's a senior designer, there's a junior designer, there's other engineer, and there's a different type of people who work together. So suppose the whole platform, what we try to do is a platform, a, a space, a playground for people to play together. So we try to think about is how can we do so-called uh, vertical integration? So um, in our education, the first year is design fundamental. So in the second year to the final year, it's a vertical integration. Allow the junior student and senior student, basically it's a junior designer, they can work with senior designer. So in that case, right, it's quite different from the traditional way. In our side, you can see, I think that time you can talk to most of the uh, alumni. They have an experience that when they work with their senior, all these are peer study, all these are uh, the way they try to work with each other, they can help each other and then they can learn something new. And then in a way, we also try to find out the other horizontal type of integration that we try to bring in different type of industry from engineering, from business school, from medicine, and then even other industry collaboration. So we can, I think we have about, about uh, 20 to 30 percent project that will be realistic type of project which work with different industry. And then people that don't always introduce something like a, a launch pay type of project which allow the people can try to become an uh, entrepreneur. And then for myself, we work with hospital. Uh, nearly every year, there's a project, uh, not only one project, it's not about a hospital data, maybe about five to 10 data will try to come out some sort of problem statement they face in their operation. How can we help them to solve the real life problem? So you will see that become a much more a rich type of integration. So just now you see from the, Wang Dong and JJ as well as Clement, everybody will introduce something new. So in that case, right, in our platform become a very unique type of the playground for the people. And then so you are able to enjoy. So if you in the earlier year, like in the second year or third year, you can choose and you can start to browse. And then in the higher year, you are able to come back and become a specialized person in this area. So that's a part for us, try to introduce something, allow the student to find their own way of doing allow them to find their own interests rather than like the other university. They only follow their in type of education. So in the end, the student, the trend is always quite similar rather than they have their own unique thinking. Okay, 
So uh, here is some of the example what I did in my uh, life in NUS. So quite often people always think about um, design is always uh, quite, we're doing for a lot of things, talk about appearance, talk about look very pretty or something else. But basically design also bringing some, uh, something very engineering, something very fundamental to the daily life. And then for myself, we try to see how can we help people in the way, how can we improve the quality of life of the human being. So uh, here, one of the projects I think in the last year, what I did is the 3D printing swap, which have been used by uh, Singapore government. And then I think now it's manufactured more than a few million and used in different hospitals. Okay. A lot of people will believe this project should be come from uh, engineering department or should be come from the engineering school. But in the end, right, basically the whole team is all come from our design people. And then the reason why is the but it's not about the whole thing come from design people. The design people, design is come from our design people. And then, but we work is the engineer, we work as engineer, we work with uh, medicine people. And then we are the people leading for the whole team. And after that, we translate to the uh, company who are doing for manufacturing. But in a way is how, why we talk about the design is quite different from other people. Is after we start to study, why we need to do a swap and then how is the user experience. And then we try to see how can we find a better interface. So for example, say, how do we find a shape? How do we design something which can, which can hold the liquid? Then when you do a swap, basically, right? You can just go in and then you just, you, you, uh, basically you need to go into your nasal pharyngeal space. And then after that, you will try to turn. And then, but you need to try to hold the liquid plus the cell. But how is the way how to do a cell? So that's the reason why we design a shape allow us to, to uh, screw and then as well as uh, to hold the liquid. So in that case, right, you can see there's a water reservoir allow us to have a better chance to sustain and to maintain better type of liquid inside there. And then so in the end, uh, we just published a paper which we can do nearly better than the current product and then have an even better uh, efficiency than the current product as well. And the other project we did is uh, also during last year, during COVID time, and then we try to help the hospital talk about intubation type uh, box to help the hospital um, doctor to protect themselves in order to uh, reduce all, the, all this of the uh, contamination type of chance. And you can see the, 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 the one on the top uh, is the other one, which we work, is a, a student project come from, uh, come from Eastern Child. And basically, right, what he tried to do is based on his observation, he found out a lot of people, a lot of immobilized patients, the parents are very, very poor. And then they need to try to wake up their uh, son or daughter and then try to move their body uh, like a three or four times a night. So in the end, right, uh, the patient have no life and then the parents also have no life. So for him, right, and then we try to think about how can we help the people? And then so we try to do some, so we did some observation, try to understand how is their daily life and then how we try to empathize, how can we help them and then through different type of observation. And in the end, we design a product uh, which by using the uh, air, fematic type of power, allow us to move the patient body. And then for us, right, I think most of our design portrait are ending here, but in the end, now we try to do is even move into a clinical trial. So in past two years, we do uh, about three different clinical trials in IMH, in uh, Econ Healthcare. So we also found out something very fun is from the clinical trial, we start to see a lot of patients because of movement, they are able to improve their bowel movement, which can provide a much more better type of stomach uh, type of movement for them. And the other ones we also identify based on the way we design, we also can help the patient to reduce their back soul. Then in that way, right? Uh, because the, the way of the uh, movement, the position movement, so we are able to be, uh, create a, the air, allow the, the soul to cure and to recover faster. And then you can see the other one, uh, the, the one down there is uh, the other project what we did uh, to help the people try to see, so how we, we try to see how can we use the other way of interaction. So we designed a product called a uh, Voctel. Voctel is the one allow us to change people taste through different type of uh, electro uh, stimuli. So we did a, a, a exhibition in London. 
So which we introduce four different type of uh, uh, product, two alcoholic, two non-alcoholic. So it's quite interesting because it, in the end, even some Muslim come and talk to us, say, okay, that's the first time they drink something, but because of the way we try to design, allow us to share different type of taste, different type of smell. So they are able to feel what is drinking type of experience, yeah. And I also doing for some other type of project, try to see how can we use a different type of a virtual reality or augmented reality to change people's life. So the one you see on the uh, screen is the project we just won the Taipei uh, VR game show, um, which um, is a one we use the uh, multi-sensory type of idea to help people to do the interaction. So uh, normally when you do for, for uh, VR, you use your eyes, but quite often, right, people will always focus on their eyes. And that's also, also the reason why they will create some sort of motion sickness. So we try to see is how can we use the other way to help people. So we create some other things. So you can see on the, on the clothes they wear, we also have a heat type of sensor. And then we also create another smell type, type of sensor and outlet. So in the end, right, the people they need to use a multi-sensory, they will based on heat, based on the smell, based on the vision, and then to play their game rather than rely on their eyes, yeah. And for me, right, quite often just now we talk about, we try to help different type of people, so, but we also have another type of new client come and talk to us. So you can see on the screen, there's another uh, project we did with um, uh, the Jerome Bird Park, okay. When Jerome Bird Park and talk to us is um, they have a home bell, they get some cat, they have a cancer. And then but if they want to do an operation, that's mean uh, the casket, they will they need to cut it out and then that will become a problem because there's no protection. So they start to exercise how can we do something to help them and then by using different type of idea. So uh, based on our experience, so we are able to design something called talk about a surgical guide to help them to do operation, to cut the things according to what we want. And then at the same time, we try to plan uh, a new so-called prosthetic uh, type of a uh, uh, cover allow the home build to be used. So you can see that is a final outcome for the, for the, uh, the home build. I think that one has been published on a lot of newspaper. And then recently, right, I think uh, the casket, the, the prosthetic has been um, dropped down because the whole uh, recovery is, is complete. So they can just grow all the things and then to copy to uh, previously, yeah. So uh, roughly that's what I want to share with you because in our education, right, I think a lot of things is quite physical and then you need to try to see how do you use your mind in integrate with what you want to do and through the action, everything can become real. And then that's a part allow us to make the dream become true. Yeah, thank you. So I think I need to introduce the next speaker, right? Uh, Brian? Okay, Brian Sloan was joined us, uh, she would say 10 years ago in the first place. When I was a head of, the, a head of division, I invite him to come over to do a, a visiting professor. And then he is really, really good in interaction design and then also in motion design. And he showed us something about motion design, some sort of genius idea to see a, a graphic uh, start to play. And yeah, it's fantastic experience. Yeah, so let's welcome Brian. Dr. Yen, thanks for that introduction. And I always tell people that it, it is you who are responsible for me being here. And hello, everybody. Uh, my formal background is in graphic design or visual communication. I studied at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Uh, I went on to a professional career in design practice, eventually got into teaching and had the good fortune to be able to teach at universities in Rio de Janeiro, in Nicaragua, in Germany in Taiwan, and then now here in Singapore. Um, if I were to sort of summarize some of the things that I'm, I'm involved in, uh, it would be communication channels, information design, uh, motion design, and interaction design. Uh, my colleagues who preceded me talked about healthcare, they talked about uh, emerging technologies, they talked about uh, product innovation, 
and of course service design. And the reality is in all of those components, all of those applications, there's going to be some type of communication plan that works in concert with those things, whether it's a branding strategy, whether it's a package design, even maybe if it's storytelling to a certain degree. All right, so there's a lot of intersection between the things that I'm involved in and of course the things that my colleagues are involved in. If I were to summarize uh, very quickly about my teaching, I would say it's about learning how to see. And that's twofold. So it's learning how to see the nuances of visual form and how they effectively communicate, but also how you use signs and symbols uh, and other references to make meaning. Uh, the other part about seeing is getting students to understand how to see opportunities and how to understand unmet needs. Uh, and I think that's really where a lot of innovation actually occurs. So with that, I only have just a few student projects that I wanted to share with you because I know you're probably more anxious to get to the question and answer. We do a lot of sort of foundational studies around communication strategies on how to use type and image and signs and then how to be able to package all of these things into, into narratives, i.e. whether that's a book or a brochure or a package or a signage system. We do a lot of activities like that. We think that, that type and typography is a very important communication channel because of course in a, in a literate society, we have so much information that comes in through our eyes and the things that we read. So we wanna make sure that legibility and readability are very, very high up on the, um, on the communication platform. We also do uh, things around identity systems design. And I share this with you from one of our second year students who was designing a mark for save our stray dogs. And so in this concept, the important component here is the idea of design synthesis. So it's taking two ideas and weaving those ideas into a unified whole. So in this case, the image of a, of a dog synthesized with the symbol of the heart to, to, to represent uh, a position of empathy. Uh, we also then look at those identity systems in a kinetic context. So in motion design, so this young lady, also a second year student, is working on a branding strategy for the uh, Postal Museum of Singapore. And she's developed, excuse me, she's developed this um, motion-based system in which uh, it makes sense if you were to present this uh, in a mobile application or website or even perhaps in an exhibit context. So the idea here is that you have the flaps of the envelope and the stamps, et cetera. I think what is uh, one of the most interesting things that we're involved in, at least from my, my teaching standpoint, is the idea of building time-based narratives. So I think everybody's seeing more and more these one, two, three minute videos in which we're presenting a concept uh, or you're sort of deconstructing some idea or you're promoting some startup and how we actually go about using sound uh, and image and graphics and time and speed and Never all of these elements. Why it's so hard to find love despite our connectivity. So this particular example, uh, this student was trying to talk about like the, the vast array of dating applications out there and how these dating applications use certain algorithms to match people and how the criteria for all of these dating applications have grown nearly exponentially. So there's a lot here and we do script writing in these instances, we do narration, we have to lay out storyboards, we have to build all the uh, graphic design assets and then we build these narratives over time. And this is a really valuable component that the students are doing because uh, now with, with COVID, that's forced us to do a lot of virtual or online presentations. So now all of our fourth year students in their thesis projects are ultimately going to end up doing a presentation similar to this. Uh, I do wanna just close on uh, just two things. Um, I am the um, founder of the Mode Summit, 
uh, and that's a conference on motion design. I put a link in the chat and we have a big student competition in that area and we, we tailor a lot of content to our students. So I'd like you to consider registering for that conference. It's in June. And also the, the co-editor of this book on motion design, if you're looking for a source there. Uh, and so before I turn it over to AJ and, and Don, I, I'd like to say, even though we've had five presenters, the reality is all of our work is very closely integrated. And then you leave DID with a very holistic perspective of what's happening in professional design practice and you'll be prepared to work on just about anything. So Don, AJ, I'll turn it back over to you. AJ, hey shall we, thanks Brian, shall we do the Q&A? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we see a lot of questions coming in really, like 11 questions. Um, mm -hmm. I think Karina will be helping us to moderate. So just feel free to keep them coming in. Thank you, Brian, for the summary and your sharing. Thanks so much, yeah. Or should we start by introducing ourselves? Yeah, yeah, why not? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah in yeah. case the, the, the uh, guests want to kind of ask you guys questions too, right? Mm. Maybe one round, then the students can uh, introduce yourselves mm -hmm. and alumni too. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Yiting. I'm a year two student. I used to be from a junior college. Uh, I studied science stream, uh, PCA. And I'm Ling. Uh, I'm a year three and I was from Nian Poly. I was studying product design and innovation. Uh, I also worked outside for three years and then I went back to study in DID. Hi, um, I'm Karina. I'm a year four student and I was from JC. Um, I did IV, so like international baccalaureate. And uh, I'm also in USP in NUS and I also went for NOC. Hi everyone, my name is Tommy. I'm a NUS uh, alumni from last year, class of 2020. Um, before DID, I was from Nanyang Polytechnic uh, studying IDA as well. Yep, nice to meet everyone. Yep. AJ, or Wait, I go first? Okay, uh, I'm Cheryl, uh, batch of 2019. Uh, I was from a JC as well, and my combi was uh, physics, chem, math, and art. Nice to meet everyone. Hey guys, um, also an alumni and graduated same year as Cheryl, 2019. Uh, before ID, um, I was mostly in the science stream in JC. Yeah, I took biochem, math, econs, yeah, if that matters. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think we can start off with some questions about the curriculum in particular, like with, with regards to the merger with school engineering, there seems to be quite a lot of questions about that. So uh, to what extent will the new collaboration with the School Engineering and SD affect the current curriculum? And that is asked by Anthony. Um, any prof wants to share some insight? Okay, I, I think there's no big difference. Well, for our curriculum, we already quite multidisciplinary, and then we work with different types of people. But in this new uh, integration, right, that means our students got some more chance to even study outside. Uh, to, for example, you can choose another uh, double, another major in the other department. Also, for example, if you think about computing, business, or other type of a, a second major. And then because the, the way of a curriculum now they try to change is allow the student have some more free time in the common space. So in that case, right, you can use that space to do a second major. So as before, I think we have much less time to do in this common space. So that's the reason why now they try to open it and then allow the people to do it. And so uh, in a way, a lot of people, that just I mentioned, is much more, you can try to cater make what you want to do rather than as before you just follow the system to do what you can do. Okay, and I think some people are wondering, um, what can engineering students do in DID or like what are the intersections between engineering and design? Okay, uh, uh, the, the very basic that will start first, right? The very basic that will start in the coming semester mm -hmm. is that uh, you will all have a common uh, design thinking uh, um, module that is run by uh, myself, uh, Brian, Hans and JJ and Clement, right? Um, so, 
that that is uh, something that both engine uh, side and uh, DIV side uh, you will you will get to do. Um, now the other things uh, may still be a little bit um, uh, being tied down. We we're not super sure yet, to be very frank, for some of the details. But um, all the schools are um, essentially trying to keep as much uh, constancy to the original program as possible, while giving you the new flexibility to. Uh, not take some things. That means like if you want almost the same thing as always before, you, ha you have the choice to do that. But now you can also drop something so that you can take uh, other stuff. Okay? It's, it's, more, it's more of an opening up of freedom, uh, some flexibility than, than to say that you're losing things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then also like with regards to curriculum, someone wants to know um, like how does the ID major compare with uh, Faculty of Engineering's IDP second major. Okay, uh, I think it's quite different uh, because in engineering, quite often they do for component rather than assistant. So in their uh, design center curriculum, they did do some other project for more product oriented, but still more engineering oriented rather than from uh, our division, right? Just now you can see most of the project we try to do, a lot of them come from uh, empathy, try to see how can we bridge the user? How can we uh, try to find the, the user need? As well as um, we not only talk about product, we try to talk about system, and then we try to talk about even service. So that is much more wider compared to the, the engineering in a way they are more focused on uh, engineering problem solving type of domain. I think this person is also asking about uh, the difference between ID and the IDP program in engineering is the innovation and design program. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I think it's like just now I mentioned also. Uh, of course, I will say our program is much better than theirs. Uh, because... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but that's quite true in some certain sense when before uh, in the open house, they'll bring their students to see our, stud uh, our work and then to tell them, say, that's what you are going to learn. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but in a way, um, I think engineering also start to change. And that's the reason why uh, the so-called integration come out. Because the engineer, they need to open their mind and then to understand more. Uh, what I mean open mind is not really say, because they are much more problem solving, they focus on something very in depth. But quite often, uh, I think in design education, we try to see holistic picture. And then we try to see from uh, how do we bridge the even industry uh, user and manufacturer. So we come from different angle. And then so that's slightly different the traditional uh, engineering education. So they also try to see how to really shift them into a different type of uh, a way of seeing things and then allow us to do much more emphasize with the product and with the people. Uh, otherwise, I think often um, so far, if you try to see the so-called technical innovation, the successful rate compared to a uh, user-driven type of innovation, I think the uh, user-driven type of innovation is much more higher in terms of a successful rate. Uh. So I think the, the best example, I think in engineering, when they talk about design thinking, they always quote uh, Apple. But Apple is the one really talk about how to use the user need, user insight to do an innovation, rather than they try to, they try to push on um, technical innovation. But of course they do have, but it's much more, they come from the user-driven type of idea. Um, I'm gonna to add to this because I just had the chance to explain this to quite some people this morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the reason why they've asked us to helm the um, human-centered uh, design thinking type of angle to teach um, both engine and uh, design and uh, the design school and then slowly extending towards the whole of NUS. It's just because of this one really peculiar thing that uh, I, I'm not sure many of you notice or not, right? Um, everybody in every discipline, whatever that you're trying to innovate or build, you ultimately are building it for humanity, right? You're building it for human users, but there is no school, at least not that I know of, that has ever released any kind of course to say, how do you design for human beings, right? There's no, there's no kind of a education. How do you design for human beings? And the only, the only place that actually does that almost uh, as, as our whole uh, obsession is in DID. And therefore, we are, we're having to now export this out to all the 
um, engine to you know computing to all the different uh, schools where um, hey maybe for for once you you can put a lot of uh, 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 focus on say developing some kind of technique some kind of material some kind of uh, 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 the tool right um, but but maybe check and align it with who's going to use it in the end also right so that's uh, that I would say if you prefer um, this kind of uh, um, something that's very tangible to the people that you're doing it for, um, then uh, you probably prefer the idea. If you prefer to kind of obsess with a, a, a component right, or a sensor and then push the maximum limit out of it without much, um, uh, that means your interest area might not be in like, oh, exactly when should I use it? But you're just interested to coax the technology um, uh, for its uh, full potential, then um, you might prefer engineering. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like moving on from the engineering based questions, I think we can talk about admissions. So some people are wondering um, if you need a portfolio to get into DID and if um, a digital or physical portfolio is preferred. Anyone have any responses? I think the, the main problem is now is we, we haven't decided this year is uh, the virtual or physical interview, right? I think the thing is, uh, yeah. So for those of you who are listening to this and feeling a little bit uncertain why we're not sure yet, <laughs> you know, um, just just uh, want to let you know that we're just uh firming things up because uh, you know, COVID sometimes makes us we think should we go back a bit to physical or should we not go back so fast? Okay, um, but uh, it's likely to be virtual, so um, digital and everything will be handy, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe if I could add to that, I mean, increasingly, uh, work is being communicated. Uh, as you know, Brian showed in, in the form of interactive media. And so whether or not the constraints are digital or physical, I think it's always a good idea to, to think digital nowadays, uh, just because you're future-proofing your, the way that you show, showcase your work. Yeah. But, but the other question is, okay, do they need to have a portfolio? In my own opinion is, if you come from JC, right? Uh, if you don't have a portfolio, I think it's quite okay for us. But if you have anything, for example, some people they show their artwork or other type of things, it's quite welcome. You show you can show different type of experience you have. Mm. And last time we have see one person fantastic show all the photography he did, and it's quite good. And then can tell us the whole story. How is the thinking behind it? Yeah, it's very fantastic. Uh, yeah, I agree. This question comes up a lot and you have to, re you know, we, we understand that uh, students that don't have a lot of experience, you would not have accumulated a lot of work to generate a portfolio. What we're looking for is people that show aptitude for design. An aptitude can be demonstrated in a lot of different ways. It can be around your writing and how you talk about a problem, uh, how you look at other interests that you have, as, as Dr. Yen said, photography and how photography and those skills around composition and seeing get transferred into a design application, all of those things, you know, we consider. So I, I, I think that everybody who asked that question, my advice to you is don't focus on what you don't have, focus on what you do have and talk about how you can put those skills and gifts into a design context. For the students and alumni, you know, if you have something you want to say to address some questions, please, please go ahead. Yeah, um, there are some students who are asking things like, you know, am, am I disadvantaged if I'm from an art stream, right? Um, the the I think that appeared a few times, and um, even if you're not from the art stream, I mean, uh, the students here who are answering, um, you you if you have classmates, you know, who you know, and then you can say on their behalf, it'd be helpful. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so I guess we can move on to those questions. So um, someone asks, is being an art stream or lack of strong knowledge in math or science a disadvantage? Um, yeah, I think there were similar questions in the Q&A. So if you're from JC art stream, would, you, would that be a disadvantage? Um, I, can, I can answer this question first, I guess. Um, I don't think so. I was from art stream. Um, I did most um, humanity-based subjects, so like literature, history, uh, economics. Um, yeah, I don't really think it would be a disadvantage at all. Um, Generally, there are some mods that maybe you might find harder to grapple with, like mods that have more like physics-based um, theories that you have to learn or like formulas or calculations. But it's it's really um, a very small, I would say it's a very small part of like your ID uh, journey. Like it's mostly in year one when you're sort of taught the fundamentals of maybe like how certain mechanisms work or how like certain laws of physics um, work. 
Um, and then once you move on from that, like year two onwards, it's pretty much very application based. So maybe you don't have to learn so much about the, the theory behind something, but you can just sort of see and touch and feel how, how things work in your life, which I don't really think you need like necessary life physics background to do that. Um, and then apply that to your designs. So I don't think you'll be at a disadvantage. Um, yeah, that, that's my opinion. <laughs> Anyone else has anything to chime in? You might have a strength in certain areas because yeah. Um, yeah, uh, design is as much a science as is an art also. And sometimes in uh, um, the matters of considering, you know, uh, should life really be like that? You know, should, what does your product say about uh, your outlook of, on life? Right, uh, that that kind of uh, inquiry or or or, or uh, processing about um, you know uh, what should you put out there, uh, what does this say about uh, people? I think that uh, usually requires some level of maturity in the area of uh, you know a humanities type inclination, right? Um, so so that um, you know some I mean if you do a search around, you might find some very interesting and provocative articles around how um, some uh, some some uh, people are, are discussing that, like you know, uh, arts degree in the long run punches way above its uh, wage, you know, as compared to a science or technical degree, which has uh, some links to things that expire sooner. Whereas you know, in in the in the art side of things, you learn things more uh, about about life thing, yeah. And design is very much about life. Okay. So Elise, you know, uh, it's 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 both ways, right? It's both ways. Yeah, I think we also have some international applicants in the in the participants, and they're wondering whether um are there any um scholarships offered for international students? I think NUS do have. Uh, they need to apply to the office of mission. Yeah, well, I think they have a uh, international stu uh local and international. Yeah, all both. Yeah. Um, and is there like a minimum SAT score required to get admission into ID? I think uh, admission office also have a criteria for NUS as a whole. So I think uh, I, I remember can check in the office admission website. There's a, a score there. Um, someone's also curious if there are many international students in ID and is it hard to cope with Singapore's education system? Um, and this person in particular is from the Philippines. Do we have any international yeah. alumni here who can speak? <laughs> there, there are a few international students in um, our batch. I mean, definitely it's like majority still Singaporean and still local students. Um, is it hard to cope with Singapore's education system? <laughs> That's not want to answer that. That's one of the students want to answer that. Yeah, I think uh, once again, that is, that's a question that might be better directed in the uh, Telegram chat, in that Telegram thread that you might then get a response directly from a student who is an international student. I can say I'm, I'm working with a young lady now uh, who's an international student. She's at the very top of her class. And I had another young lady from India last semester and she, she seemed to thrive as well. But I think it, it's better that they speak on that on their own behalf, because uh, maybe we're looking at it from a very narrow perspective. But NUS have a very good uh, international type of mixture for education. I think the whole NUS have more than 100 nationality for, of the student. So I think it's still quite good for uh, a different type of national, a different type of country to, to fit into the system here. Yeah, I think some of them are also wondering like how do you apply from other countries? So in particular, someone's applying from Europe and someone is applying from New Zealand. And they're wondering how would it work, how would international applications this year um, be processed under the COVID situation? I think someone also asked if um, IB is accepted and I think I can attest to that and answer that it, uh, it is because I did IB as well. Yeah, but mm -hmm. with regards to the application for international students. Um, the international student, I think is still, uh, I think central apply to a mission office. OAM. So uh, you need to go to their website and then in different country, uh, you see OAM website, you can see a equivalent diploma or certificate you need to take. So uh, you can try to see 
way the uh, the education now you have is equivalent to that or you need to take some exam to qualify that okay yeah um and then i think there are just uh, some other questions about intake like why is the student intake so small in id In one way, uh, design education, we prefer a much more smaller class, which we allow to look after uh, much, much more in-depth type of education, and then can look after different students. And I think if you try to see traditional design education, they also um, have much more like uh, they follow Sifu type of idea. So quite often, right, you don't have less of the chance to really work with so many students, and then you have less of time to help to help everybody. So that's the reason why we keep quite small. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Shifu means like master or like uh, for anyone in the audience who doesn't speak Chinese, yeah. Hey, uh, what was the, what's KGT's uh, question about? K G oh, why are there so many girls than guys? No, no, uh, was there something else that we missed out or something? Yeah, it's about the, the female population. That's the, main, yeah. oh, that's the one, that's the question? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, it changes every year. We also don't know why. Um, in the past, there was a lot more guys and now it's a lot more girls. We have absolutely no idea why. Um, the, <laughs> I, I don't know, do you guys know why? And then the, the, on the reverse side, we have more male teachers and then uh, almost no female teachers. So it baffles me too. <laughs> um, actually, NUS released um, the statistics for like uh, 2020 20, 21. Um, so it's actually 21 males and 29 females. So I think it's still somewhat fair. Where are you talking about? Um, you mean, you mean, you mean for <laughs> overall the whole university? Yeah, they, they state like how many uh, females, males are actually accepted. So in case KG is still uh, interested, you can go to that link to like see. Um, oh, so overall, uh, university is, is higher females, is it? Uh, just for this year, 2020 21. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe. Hmm. Yeah. So along with the whole uh, about gender, someone asked, "What are your opinions of women in industrial design?" As I've seen some articles online regarding the woman to men ratio, I, I assume this person is talking about in industry, or maybe in academia. I'm not very sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Um. An anonymous attendee, maybe you can send a little chat message uh, to tell us, do you mean uh, more women, less women? Uh, and what's the constant you might have? I I've personally seen very good women industrial designers and very good men industrial designers. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, from our um, like we have a very successful female designer as well. And then now it's a creative director in BMW design work. And we also have a very successful uh, male designer, won a lot of uh, president design award winner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how to say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to questions around curriculum. Uh, someone wants to know like, may you know in which year will the students choose an area or industry to focus on? like service industry or medical industry? In, in our system, right, you don't need to choose. <laughs> well, it's a bidding system. So quite often is uh, in the bidding, you you try to bid for that one. So it's really uh, based on bidding rather than you need to declare what is the one you want to do. So saying that in another way, it means that you can keep choosing and choosing and choosing every semester. Right. Yeah. Uh, as you get more clear, you can uh, choose what you prefer to do more of. Right. Uh, yeah. You don't have to to kind of like fix it at a certain point in time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that's one of the interesting parts about the course. Um, some of you were asking about the uh, what's unique to DID's education. Uh, I think Dr. Yen, uh, whole his whole presentation was that just now. Right. Uh, the whole platform system is uh, pretty oh. unique. Um, and really gives us a lot of choice to to um, uh, feel like we are in control of the the the, the things that you want to learn, uh, okay. Um, but, but at the same time, still very integrated with everybody else, and uh, everyone sees everyone's works, so that's quite nice. Yeah. I think that that kind of a uh, dynamic you don't see so much in other schools. 
and, and of course, if you look at our <laughs> if you look at our new new kind of information site, you'll find that like maybe the 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 project mix is self evident, and also the uh, teacher mix is also self evident. Yeah. Yeah, Cheryl, do you want to share something? Yeah, if I may add on, I think the one thing that I really really appreciate about industrial design is the fact that we get to try like especially second year onwards, we get to try so many different types of projects. We can. Uh, we can try service, we can try uh, product design and different different fields. So it helps us to like um, clarify and specialize as we go along. Yeah. But if you're unsure, you can just keep trying until like you kind of figure it out. Yeah. Mm. But if you know you can just keep taking right, as Don has mentioned. Yeah. Mm. Just, just to add to that as well, um, for platforms, you'll be taking it along with other years so you're not just taking it with the people you come in with but you'll be taking it with your seniors with the juniors and and i think that vertical nature of the platform is also part of the the secret sauce right it's it's um there's a lot of uh, peer learning and growth uh, because you, you you're not just like progressing with your back but you see what someone else ahead of you in a course can do and, and you strive for that. So, so that's, that's also one of the things that the platform system encourages. Yeah, someone also asked, what is the learning like from year two onwards when doing projects? Is it mostly self-learning or are there still modules and classes that teach us certain programs like After Effects, SketchUp or 3D modeling? Uh, maybe Lee- The students should answer this, yeah. The students yeah, are. since you just also moved on from year two to year three. Wait, sorry, the question again. <laughs> uh, like, what is learning like moving from year two to year three? Is it still a lot of like self learning, and or are there more classes that teach specific things like After Effects, SketchUp, three D modeling? So it's like mm -hmm. platforms versus like core curriculum, I would say. Yeah, I I would say um year two technically if you're di direct poly right, let's say um you're sort of still taking modules in year three where you're taking with your um sort of year twos, sort of like. Direct your direct your uh direct poly will be taking with the year twos and then you're still sort of constantly learning and most of the modules are not sort of like stagnant like what Dr. Yen says. So probably you'll learn up to date what is relevant in the industry, sort of like computational design and such, right? So all these little like things are always updated and so like you're constantly learning, not just in your platforms, but also in your lessons in the core lessons. Yeah. So um Likewise, I also think that because of the nature of our platforms are always updated, right? You always get to um, take very relevant uh, platforms and then some of them require you to be updated in certain uh, fundamentals like service design and such, right? And so you're always exposed to all these new elements and also your professors are always constantly try, like giving you information to sort of like be updated and your seniors also will be there. Yeah, so you're always learning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think in platforms, you maybe learn a bit more in depth with regards to a certain skill or maybe like a certain type of design, like service design, for instance. But the basics are, st are taught in year one and also some in year two. Like I think computing for design is taught in year two and technology for design is taught in year two. So um, yeah, year two, you kind of have a mix of uh, core curricular mods as well as uh, platform modules where you're more specific, where you're more focused on solving a specific problem, for instance. Um, yeah. Uh, someone also asked, like, how does how do you fit NOC into your schedule, and will you be missing out on certain modules? So for me, like NOC, there's a one year track and there's a six month track. So I took the one year track, meaning that I I was not in DID for a year, and so this basically replaces two of your the platform modules that you will do, which is equivalent to four projects. So yeah, you'll be missing out on those modules, and and you'll just be missing out on those modules, and and not any other like core curricular mods. So that means that like in my portfolio, I guess I would have like um four projects lesser than a, a student who didn't go for noc so um, actually noc fits into id pretty well like we're pretty fortunate that you don't have to extend your candidature or you don't have to um really do anything else um if you go for noc you don't have to catch up or anything um it fits into the curriculum very nicely i would say it's just whether um, you want to go for noc or you want to have four other uh, portfolio projects in your portfolio um with regards to that so yeah you won't be missing any modules or anything yeah uh that to add on, right? I think then again, there's also this option to like have a, a year of leave of absence to actually pursue and get some uh, ex external internship or work experiences outside before coming back to NUS to sort of like uh, continue your, your 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 education. So like, there's always this option. So don't don't think that um 
that's just one pathway to get your degree. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure whether you can take a leave of absence to go for NOC though. I think if you go for, if you take a leave of absence, it's probably, um, you'll find your own opportunities outside <laughs> of the NS, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, coffee, I guess, right? sorry? Because of COVID and basically there's another option, uh, it's uh, for exchange. Quite often, right, there's one semester exchange. So for the people who go for NOC, you don't have a chance to go for exchange, yeah. Okay, someone also asked, could you expand on what NOC is? So uh, very briefly, uh, I'm sure you can like Google this, but very briefly, NOC it stands for NUS Overseas College. So it's an entrepreneurship program uh, done by NUS. So it's an NUS-wide thing. Like you can do it even if you're not a design student where you um, intern at a startup for a year or six months overseas. So there are selected countries that are part of this program. Some of these countries include like Silicon Valley, Stockholm, uh, New York, Beijing. Uh, I'm not very sure about how, how it's going to be carried out now given that, um, given COVID. But yeah, so it's basically a startup entrepreneurship program that you can add to your curriculum if you if you are interested in startups. Yeah, um, along with overseas exposure, someone asked, um, are there any student exchange programs overseas? And uh, yes, uh, ID has um, quite a lot of um, exchange partner schools that um, are also part of um, the curriculum. Does, has anyone here gone for any or like to talk about it? Like Cheryl, do you go, do you go for exchange? I didn't go for exchange. I stayed in Singapore. Oh, Tommy also didn't go for exchange, right? <laughs> like supposed to, but like um got cancelled like because of COVID. But like yeah, I was supposed to go to Netherlands, uh Delft. Um yeah, um it's a technological university. Um um but yeah, never mind. Um so now that's why I'm like pursuing internship. So there's always other opportunities to constantly learn. Yeah. <laughs> AJ, did you manage to go for exchange? Yeah, yeah, I went for exchange in Eindhoven, uh, in Netherlands, like when I was in year three. But I'm wondering, is there a specific question, like thing that you want to find out more about, like exchange program or? Yeah, the question was more just like other exchange programs, which I guess answers is, is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, you can see the list of schools on our website. Yeah. Uh, I do have a very high percentage of person can go for exchange. I think much more higher than average in the US. Uh, I remember it's more than 70%. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think I remember in my batch, and it's not like not too long ago. Um, think about, yeah, you're right, like about 70%. Like once it's an exchange period that semester, like the studio for that batch is like pretty empty. It's only like a few people. But some people choose not to go for exchange or NOC because they want to work for, they want to intern for a specific company, like for example. Yeah, so they might choose to look for their own companies like overseas or also stay and intern in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on what you want to get out of that semester. Yeah, what kind of opportunities you prefer. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there's also a few questions about like whether ID, like people are curious whether ID suits them or not. So one particular, there's this question that says, uh, what if such innovations interest me, but I don't have any burning ideas of what I want to invent. And I'm not sure if I have a passion for industrial design. How do I find out if I have a passion for it or not? Anyone has any thoughts? <laughs> I mean, I think it's quite an interesting question. It is um, an interesting question. Yeah. I, I I, think, yeah. Okay, you, you can go first. I don't think we sit around uh, all day feeling like we need to make something. Uh, that's not what uh, industrial designers uh, are actually like. Um, but uh, I would just say this, that uh, the course certainly trains you to acquire a healthy discontent for things that are around. Once you get you know, a bit more um, sensitive to how things can be better, maybe that's when you will feel like you want to change everything. Um, but of course, uh, doing that the whole day is just a little bit tiring too. So, <laughs> so yeah, so um, uh, I, I guess we, 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 we acquire that ability, but then we learn to turn it on and off, you know, uh, when you feel like working and not. So um, I, I, I wouldn't worry that you don't feel like you have something you want to make. Um, but if you have had inclinations around like, uh, you know, when you've seen something problematic and you, you were thinking of like fixing it uh, you, and you had some thoughts on how it could be better, right? Then I think you, you, are, you are exhibiting, I mean, maybe at least to yourself, some uh, tendency to want to improve stuff, right? Uh, whether or not there's stuff to improve right now in front of you, it's not, not so much the, the, the important thing, okay? Yeah, I think like, maybe to add on, because the question like, touches on like, also whether or not you know what your passion is like, at that point in time, I think I, before DID, like, I really had no idea like, what my passion was. But, and I also didn't know what ID was. I didn't know what design was. 
So I think I just knew that I was sort of interested in some aspects. I was interested in things that were beautiful. But at the same time, I didn't want to do just furniture design because I was looking at, you know, like mostly furniture design, uh, like magazines at that time. But yeah, so like beauty, but I was also like interested in, okay, making something impactful uh, in someone's like, daily life. So it's like, yeah, I didn't know if like those two things and like, different things that fit together. And I didn't know that that was part of IDEO. So I just like, okay, just like when my gut, like all the projects looks interesting. And only like when I was inside and I took on a few projects and I realized, oh, okay, there's actually many more things that I could explore. And like, as you're doing things, I'm not talking about just the ID, just like anywhere you go, like when you're trying the thing that you're interested in and discovering more, then you would have a better idea of what you might be more interested in and want to learn more about. So I think, yeah, I think don't worry too much about like finding what your passion, knowing what your exact passion is at that point in time. Just do the next thing that you're interested in or want to learn more about. Yeah, that's for me. Okay. To, to manage the, the time a little bit, uh, or we'll be here till 9, 9 p.m. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's do one uh, quick lightning round where we just really blaze through all the questions with uh, direct answers quickly, mm. right? Um, so uh, let's let's go on the Q and A list, right? Uh, uh, okay, the first one I think is not a question, right? Uh, so let's let's skip that. The um, okay uh, okay. So anyone has a quick answer to the? Uh, am I seeing the same sequence as all of you? Should be right. I think so. Okay, yeah. So anyone who has a quick answer to that, uh, just just answer it, and then we can uh, uh, have that question dismissed. Maybe oh, question. Uh? Should, I, should I run through the Please. question? All right. Sorry. Did we answer that already? The, this question. Uh no, we, we asked for like a follow up question, but I don't think anyone um, I don't think anyone. Uh, clarified it, so we can move on from that. Uh, okay. Okay. The basic opinions of women in industrial design, right? Uh, that's the question, right? So I'll just yeah. give my opinion. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of good uh, women designers, right? Um, so I, I, yeah, there's, there's, I don't see any disadvantage in either gender, okay? Um, what percentage of the early graduates are employed in the design-related job upon graduation? Uh, anyone has the info answer? I don't have a percentage, but most of my Mostly, friends... Yeah. Yeah, they're they in the design field. Yes. And if those that are not, they are actually, to answer KG's question also, those that are not, uh, they chose not to because they found other passions and they agree that uh, ID has equipped them to, like my friend was, is doing baking right now. Yeah. So they say that um, ID also helped them with like to equip them with their other passion. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say mostly will be in design related, okay? unless there's something else. So, uh, okay, let's, let's done. Okay, uh, guys, any lightning round help? Our lightning is very not lightning. <laughs> oh, sorry, so, so I read the questions or are you going to read the questions? I don't know. I mean, we can all read. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think a lot of the international uh, related questions that we answered just now already um, to check the NUS website. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, just one overall question for all admission stuff. Um, actually, DID does not control at all any admission stuff, right? We only get... Uh, uh, the applicants after the NUS central system passes it to us. So uh, it's really the best to go to Office of Admissions website. Okay, so that's uh, for admissions questions. I'm, I'm pasting the link into chat for scholarships for international students. So check it out. Uh, next, okay. how would you describe the student culture at DID? Uh, I'll say, answer, yeah. yeah, I'll say it's very uh, friendly. Or coming, um, that's, it's, a, it's a good learning environment. Definitely, like, um, slightly, like, maybe, like, competitive. You might find it to be competitive. I found it a bit competitive <laughs> when I first joined. Uh, but it's primarily. Are you because, the competitive one? Uh, maybe. But um, I think it's primarily just a different mode of thinking because, like, when you're in JC or I'm not sure about Poly, but, like, usually when you do your work, it's very individual. So, like, only you see the essay that you write, only you see the, mm -hmm. I don't know, the math that you're doing but in ID everything's very visual everything is like very demonstrable so you can literally just look across and see like, what your friend is doing and um so in that, that sense like the the notion to compare yourself becomes more um possible um and it might take a while for you to like adjust to that maybe um 
But I think everyone's generally very friendly. Obviously, it depends on different batches. Um, everyone's very willing to help out, especially because everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. And out of the day, like you realize that like um, combining like the different strengths and weaknesses of different people ultimately help the project to be much better. So I think it's good that we have a very like collaborative nature as well. Um, does anyone want to quickly chime in? Uh, okay. If you see the background of mine and also Dr. Yen's, right? Basically, this is the studio that the environment is totally open, so everyone can hear each other <laughs> technically. So. Um, we can also see each other's pro progress. Technically, you're allowed to be a capo to, to just walk around and ask questions. But mm. yeah. <laughs> in short, it's, it's nice. La. You will know people and people will know you. right? Mm. And that doesn't really happen in many uni courses. Okay? Uh, it's a place whereby you will, you will, you will kind of uh, have a community. I think yeah. you're more hands on with your professors, um, which is also quite fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I can add to that as well. I think, like, we might say it's nice, right? But I think for me, I, I hated it first. Like, especially when I was in like, year one, year two, I really hated the culture. But because I was very, still am, like, very self-conscious. And that means, yeah, it really, like, pushed me to be okay with getting feedback and be okay with having my works showcased and, like, seen by other people and to get help from other people and like, asking for help. So, yeah, it really depends on your personality. Like, for me, I'm just, like, really shy. And like it's a cure, especially at first. So, but it really like pushed me to just get help and like take feedback more, yeah, effectively lah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it might feel difficult at first, but it gets better. <laughs> okay, moving on is the idea more suited for introverts or extroverts? I think like AJ kind of answered that question a bit. Uh, the thing is, we need both. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the most brilliant designers I've ever worked with is a is an introvert. Uh, great ideas and designing things from a position of empathy comes from both perspectives. And what we try to do is allow our students to express themselves in a manner that's most comfortable for them. So if introverts feel better at presenting their work through writing, we allow them to have that platform to do so. And then conversely, extroverts, they like to get up on stage and make presentations, we allow them to do that too. So I, I, I would say, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, you should have no reservations in coming into DID. Maybe I could just add, to, add on a bit as well. I think DID, um, the whole culture is very real. And so in a sense, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, this is the kind of work culture that you're likely going to get yourself into professionally. And I think that um, the DID studio kind of mimics that. And so not only are our students learning new skills and all that, they're also training in terms of professional development, right? Because this is how design teams work in the real world. Mm. Yeah, okay. Our next yeah. question. So how do people bid? Because I heard that bidding in some courses is a little hard. How do people find teammates for platforms? Uh, this question is like very specific, but uh, mm. yeah. I'm answer this. <laughs> <laughs> Should we answer this? Um, um, I think so, maybe platform. <laughs> I mean, platform when, biddings just to so I'm I'm platform coordinator. Platform <laughs> bidding is separate from NUS uh, module bidding. So um, every ID student is guaranteed a space in one platform, and it's an internal bidding. So you're not you're just competing among your your batch mates. Um, yeah, regarding finding teammates for platforms, I've heard that different years have have different strategies for doing that. Uh, yeah. I do not know this. Really. You just ask around, basically. Yeah, but um, just know that if your question is about trying to find teammates to go into the platforms together, no, it's not. That's not how it works, right? You get into the platform and then like whatever, whoever is there, you know, you form groups inside it. You just have to form groups, so um, it wouldn't be like oh, oh I don't have a teammate, you know. Yeah. Uh, no worries on finding teammates. Um, basically, I think most professors will actually ensure that everyone gets like a fair game. So like, yeah, you'll always solve. Find, find that, that partners that you need. Okay. Uh, do we need to choose what type of design to specialize in? I think we answered this just now, no. Uh, what are your understanding of the differences between product and industrial design? It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same, more or less, yeah. Are there 11 students in DID year four? Uh, no, we have about 44 students. I, I think, yeah, I think the registrar, the document that I sent, I think maybe the thing, like a bit, I don't know how they calculate that 11, but like, oh. yeah, like Korean, yeah. like, how many students? <laughs> yeah, every year is like 40, 40 like that, like 40, 50 yeah. like that. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the literature one is based on the way that the student promote. Now, so quite often because of the NOC, because of exchange. Uh, okay. We got a great haven come back. Yeah. How's the student life in DID? I think we touched on this a bit just now. Um, is it as hectic as Aki where there's minimum social life? Uh, you have a social life with your group mates, essentially. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you have that. a social life with the people in studio with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's also time management. Uh. Some of my friends can go for frisbee and stuff like that and hot yeah. events. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and I have friends who also work like while they were studying too. But because they prefer like having to be able to focus on different things, the so distance aside, and then coming back to approach your projects again with a different mindset. So I think it depends on your style. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's not the easiest course, right? I would just say that you know you certainly will push yourself a bit more if you want to do quite well, right? Um, um but of course there are students we've seen in the past who somehow can do uh you know uh pretty decently with very little time, right? Um, yeah, but but most students they do they do kind of uh on one hand either like it so much that they just keep working. Right. Um. Or they they actually like the community that they you know even if they don't have to work they they are here, right. Um. That's what happens a lot. Um. And then since they're here they might as well work. So that's what happens. <laughs> you know. Um. But uh. But yeah. It's 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 a it's uh known to be um. I think quite hectic. But uh, I think also known to be not as hectic as Aki, just a little less. I think. Yeah. <laughs> but that's impressions only. Okay. Impressions only. Uh. Do DID grads tend to work in corporate or consulting firms? Both. Both. Both, yeah. Both. Yeah. It depends on your preference, right? Um, if you prefer to do a large variety of things, you usually go consulting. If you prefer like, you know, seeing how your work uh gets um fits into a bigger picture of uh you know uh say a company, uh, then some people like the corporate. Okay, next question. How much access do we have to design facilities like workshops, materials, computers for projects? Or own projects related to design. Do we need certs to use certain facilities? Uh no. Uh in fact, I think like based on the Telegram group, right? I think maybe there's a bit of uh confusion on like needing certs to operate the machines. Basically, there will always be workshop technicians inside the workshops to assist you in uh doing whatever uh using the the proper equipment and such. But it's only in the case like very special cases where let's say uh, technicians are busy and then if you need to operate it, then you need the certificates, but most cases you don't need because there's enough um, um, technicians inside to help you. Yeah, I hope that answers. Yeah, okay. How is grading like in DID compared to other courses? It's so clearly not an exam score kind of thing. So. There, there are very few uh, modules in, in ID that are uh, exam-based. Uh, most, most modules are project-based. And so it, it really depends on the requirements for the project. Uh, like, like, we, like Dr. Ian mentioned, Don mentioned, you know, like at, for different platforms, the platform leader would have their own uh, kind of metric for, for grading that platform. And that is communicated to students at the beginning of platforms. Uh, and so, uh, like men, <laughs> I guess it's not really an answer, but it depends on the platform that you're taking. Mm -hmm. uh, for the more skill-based classes, like right now I'm teaching computing for design, then it's really about uh, some very clear um, skill development kind of metrics that we also tell, you know, let students know beforehand and they aim to meet those, um, those requirements for their projects. I think the most different is, uh, I think for example, in engine, right? They have a lot of exam course, but I think in ID, we very few exam course. It's more project based. Mm. Oh yeah, that, that would be one reason to see where, where you prefer, right? If you don't <laughs> like exams, then this is the place. To... <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Um, yeah, we have a MacBook question. Uh... <laughs> Um, and then I think after that we can look at the ones in the comment in the chat list. Uh, yeah. There are still a few that haven't been answered. Mm -mm. Uh, I don't think there's a difference in using Mac and Windows. But then again, if you are doing a lot of like rendering and a lot of like adding things, then I think Windows might be um, better in the sense that 
Yeah, because just for the GPU power and such, right? But then again, there's always uh, the computer lab to, to, to borrow the, the laptops to render your thing. So they, it's like a rendering farm there. So no worries on that. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Uh, I see next question on the chat is Chia Shen's question. Uh, is DID similar to DNT in secondary school? Right. Um, I'm not sure how your DNT is like. Uh, there will be some elements that are similar, but it's very different uh, uh, in, in totality. Okay. Um, I think DNT is very much a, um, like a technical craft uh, type of uh, thing as far as I know it. Uh, whereas uh, in DID, you, you, I mean, just take a look at the, the projects on the, on the website. You will, you will see that it's totally different. Okay? Uh, there's a lot more human centricity to it and a lot more uh, research to it than uh, uh, technical craft. Okay? But if you like DNT, um, chances are you like some aspects of DID. Okay, let's see any more others below. Um, KGT, have you any of you? I don't know if he's asking students or teachers. Maybe oh. Tommy can answer this question. Have any of you designed a product that has been mass produced in the market? Um, yeah, so I did the uh, the Kickstarter project under Dawn. Yeah, so designing a reusable straw that uh, is currently in the market. Yeah, I can send a link. Uh, later on, um, yeah. So so yes, we, I have done it uh, with uh, two other group mates. Yeah. So even for my thesis project, also um the recycling bin that I did also is under um is under collaboration with a, a bin man manufacturer also. So things like that you kind of like learn beyond just uh, within the, the curriculum lah. So I think that's that's great. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we're almost done. Yeah, what is the success rate in which graduates get a job after the course or do they end up becoming insurance agent? No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, they don't. <laughs> very few, <laughs> unless very, very few, <laughs> unless they unless they really, really like insurance. Uh there there has been, but very few. Yeah. But, but it's also quite interesting yeah, because some of the people, for example, they work for insurance company, but they are they are not insurance agent. Uh, for example, I think we have few people work for service design in insurance company, and then they try to see. How they how can they change do an innovation to change all the uh, user touch point? So quite often you may see the the name car is come by insurance company, but they are not really an agent. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a pity that JJ had to leave early, but um she can speak to this much better. But we actually increasingly see a lot of graduates working for uh, designer working as designers in companies like DBS, OCBC, SIA, uh, Great Eastern, uh, KPMG even. Um, and, and they are working as design strategists within these kind of non-traditionally non designed uh, companies uh, to kind of lead the design thinking teams within uh, these companies, yeah. So that, that is kind of what uh, JJ was talking about with regard to the whole service design uh, as, as this up and coming industry. Yeah, I think we have our student now is a vice president in banking as well for service design. Okay, uh, we're done, right? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, any last words from any of the students and alumni here in this, uh, in this uh, panel? I mean, we see that there's still 29 attendees uh, at this point. So, I mean, the teachers have spoken a lot. So, if any of you want to share anything? Last words for you. Uh, yeah, if let's say you still have questions, uh, you can just go uh, click in the, sorry, the link to go into our Telegram group and then um, our, our students and our professors will help you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. okay. Right. Hey guys, thanks very much for being here with, with, with us, uh, with the teachers. Okay, everyone. Uh, thank Someone you. Someone just asked any advice you would give to the applicants. Where? <laughs> Where? On the Q and A. I think oh, just the last question. <laughs> last question. Uh, applic you if you mean for the interview, um, I've written a long post in Telegram and pinned it there. That's probably a good reference. Hmm. Okay, go to the Telegram group and that, that one is a good one. Uh, if I read the whole thing out, it'll take too long. Okay, have a good weekend.
Thank you. Thanks, Clement. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Dr. Ian. Thanks, Karina. AJ. Thank Tommy. you, guys. Like the 30 people who stayed yeah. on till the end. <laughs> <laughs> Hope it was helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.